It's common knowledge that the Los Angeles Rams don't enjoy late season trips to the NFL snow belt. Last week in Cleveland, the Sunshine Boys were put in deep freeze, especially on offense, where Pat Hayden was pressured constantly and intercepted four times by a Cleveland Brown defense that held Los Angeles to a single touchdown. The Browns offense had no such problems as their newly revved up attack accounted for a field goal and four touchdowns. The first on a tight end reverse by super rookie Ozzie Newsom, number 82. The prime reason for Cleveland's resurgence has been Brian Seif, who had another big day through the year, hitting on 15 of 23 for 246 yards while piercing the Rams' number one ranked defense at will. Sipes' main target was Reggie Rucker, number 33, who was one of only three receivers in the NFL to average over 20 yards a catch. Wesley Walker and Mel Gray are the others in this select triumvirate. Despite Cleveland's high-powered air attack, the issue was in doubt until the final quarter, when help came from an unexpected but highly encouraging source. Greg Pruitt, injured nearly the whole season, iced the game with a sensational skittering, twisting touchdown that propelled the Browns back into the playoff picture. Their 30 points was the most scored this season against Los Angeles, which despite the upset remains two games ahead of the nearest NFC Western Division rival, the surprising Atlanta Falcons. In sunny, balmy Atlanta, the New Orleans Saints threatened to run the Falcons right out of playoff contention. A 28-yard touchdown burst by Chuck Muncie, coupled with a 71-yard bomb from NFC leading passer Archie Manning to rookie tight end Larry Hardy, gave the Saints a seven-point lead in their bid to win a sixth game for the first time in their history. With playoff hopes fading, Atlanta's 14th-ranked attack threw off their yoke of conservatism. Quarterback Steve Bartkowski, in a performance reminiscent of his collegiate escapades at the University of California, put the ball in the air 44 times for 266 yards. While the attack rolled up nearly 400 yards of offense, Atlanta's number two ranked defense shut off any further St. shenanigans with a ferocious pass rush that had heads on both teams spinning. Three weeks ago, the Falcons beat the Saints with a desperation last second Bartkowski bomb to Alfred Jackson, number 85. Last week with 30 seconds left, it nearly happened again. What did happen two plays after Jackson's disastrous drop was a pass interference penalty that put the ball on the New Orleans one with 10 seconds remaining. With plenty of pocket time, Barkowski calmly hit number 86 tight end Jim Mitchell for the winning score and another incredible ending. Thanks to their second miracle finish in three weeks, both 20 to 17 at the expense of the Saints, Atlanta is in excellent position for a playoff berth, while their opponents, the stunned Saints, are still seeking that elusive sixth victory. As for the amazing Atlanta Falcons, it now appears they are the NFL's 1978 version of Destiny's Darling. Playing in the home Florida warmth with a healthy and sharp Bob Greasy, fans were sure their Dolphins would avenge an opening game loss to the surprising New York Jets. Unfortunately, Bob Greasy had one of his extremely rare off days, turning the ball over four times on a costly fumble and three interceptions. Conversely, Jet quarterback Matt Robinson had his finest day in a New York uniform, 
passing for over 250 yards on 17 completions. Wesley Walker's touchdown catch iced the second Jeff thrashing of the Dolphins, 24 to 13. Dapper New England tight end Russ Francis is one big reason why the Patriots are preparing to savor the AFC East Championship. On the other hand, the Baltimore Colts are a model of a team in decline who only occasionally fashion together a winning design. Joyful moments in Baltimore have been virtually non-existent this season, and once again versus the Patriots, they failed. Baltimore has the worst defense in the NFL this season, and number 32 Andy Johnson found the cold defense eager to maintain their generosity. The Patriot offense moved virtually at will as a suspect Baltimore secondary surrendered nearly 250 yards on merely nine Steve Grogan completions. Grogan's 75-yard mastery to Stanley Morgan, number 86, illustrated New England's ability to strike instantly from long range, a Patriot pattern this year, while Mike Haynes' untouched interception return was indicative of the type of day the Patriots' defense had as New England coasted to a 35-14 Colt corralling. Winning nine of their last ten and going two up on Miami, New England is the trendsetter in the AFC East, and they know it. Like a cougar stalking the shadows and waiting for the precise instant to strike, Tom Landry's Dallas Cowboys resumed their late season onslaught on Thanksgiving Day. At stake stood sole possession of first place in the NFC East. And with such a foe as the arch-rival Redskins, Dallas clearly separated the contenders from the pretenders. Doomsday showed why there is no better in the NFL against the rush and continually took advantage of one of the league's worst pass protection units. While the Dallas defense used physical domination to get their point across, the Cowboy offense employed a blend of depth and execution. With number 35 Scott Laidlaw filling in for injured fullback Robert Newhouse, Dallas offense never missed a beat. However, his 122 yards and two touchdowns were but a small part of an offense that revolved around the hot hand of Roger Staubach. Staubach wore out the Redskins secondary with passes to Drew Pearson, who easily exceeded the 100-yard mark and helped the Cowboys maintain the distinction of being the NFL's number one passing club. A contest billed as a drama unfolded into a comedy by halftime and an embarrassment by game's end. After losing an earlier matchup with Washington, revenge belonged to Dallas. As one might expect, Washington, though thoroughly beaten, fought back to score their only touchdown as Joe Theismann passed to Gene Fugit. This effort proved to be purely academic in a 37 to 10 Cowboy lecture and came when most of the Cowboy regulars had already kicked off their shoes, propped their feet up, and settled in for a short winter's nap, dreaming about this week's more worthy opponent, the New England Patriots. This time of year, the windy city of Chicago can get mighty cold, rough on the natives even worse on visitors from such places as tropical Tampa. On the outside, the Bucks did their best to show that the cold would not affect their play, and for over half the game, such subterfuge seemed to be working for them. 
But the surging Bears got great performances out of running backs Roland Harper and Walter Payton, who rushed for a combined total of 249 yards. It paved the way for a pair of second-half touchdowns as Chicago beat the frozen Buccaneers 14-3. These two NFC Central rivals were just playing out the string. But up in Green Bay, the Vikings and Packers were battling to break a first place tie. It was a game as close as the division race itself, with many of its plays wavering indecisively before choosing which club they would benefit. The yards did not come easily for either team, and infrequent advances were often attained on above and beyond heroics such as this grab by Green Bay's Rich McGeorge, number 81. For 58 minutes, the Green Bay defense dominated the Vikings and quarterback Fran Tarkenton, sacking him three times while intercepting four of his passes. But with only two minutes left to play and the Vikes trailing 10 to three, Sir Francis put together one last drive. And with just 14 seconds remaining, he hit Ahmad Rashad, number 28, to tie up the ball game. A full overtime followed, but neither team could score, ending the affair in a 10-10 stalemate. The pack had them, but couldn't hold them. And if both teams should end the year with the same record, Minnesota would be central champs because of an earlier win over Green Bay. Faced with these facts, the Packer brass was fit to be tied. In recent years, the bounces never quite seemed to go in favor of the Philadelphia Eagles. But this is 1978, and last week in St. Louis, Dick Vermeil's team once more gained some retribution for many of the bad breaks they had endured in the past. Eagles won their fourth game in a row with the tried and true formula that has worked throughout their whole season. A stifling defense and just enough offense to get the job done. This time the offensive hero was tight end Rich Osborne, number 86. Philadelphia won 14 to 10 to keep its playoff hopes intact. As long as their formula keeps working, the Eagles will stick with it. Such is not the case with the Cincinnati Bengals, who are trying any means possible to win. You've heard of the soccer-style place kicker. Now meet the soccer-style suicide squatter. Despite this better-than-average Pele impersonation, the Bengals lost their fourth straight game, this one to Houston 17-10. The Oilers overcame a 10-0 deficit with help from people like running back Ronnie Coleman, number 47. The victory avenged an earlier Oiler loss to these same Bengals since his only win of the season. It also solidified Houston's hopes for postseason play as they now boast the AFC's third best record. Another team that entertained playoff possibilities was the San Diego Chargers. But last week in Kansas City, such dreams were shattered by an aroused Chiefs defense. Kansas City held the highly ranked San Diego attack to a paltry 11 first downs while intercepting five Charger passes. Chiefs used these turnovers to score two touchdowns within 90 seconds. One, a pass to former Charger Larry Dorsey, number 80. The other score was a picture-perfect Mike Livingston rainbow to number 89, Henry Marshall, propelling the Chiefs to a 23-0 upset win. Kansas City's first shutout in five years. With the AFC's fourth best defense, many of the Chiefs were not that surprised with their performance. But the Chargers certainly were surprised, 
surprised and now just about eliminated from the playoffs. Thanksgiving Day in Detroit, an NFL tradition. Even though the Lions aren't a contender, it's still a festive occasion. Lion fans used to drink to the exploits of such legendary greats as Joe Schmidt, Roger Brown, and Dick Knight Train Lane. But these days, Detroit's reigning hero is rookie defensive end Al Bubba Baker, the main man in a swarming defensive line known as the Silver Rush. They lead the entire NFL in quarterback sacks, and though they're still somewhat anonymous, against the Denver Broncos, their methods were brutally effective. On Turkey Day, they buried Denver's Craig Morton six times and even made his head hurt. Meanwhile, the Lion attack pushed aside the Orange Crush defense for two short touchdowns. And after 59 minutes, 56 seconds, surprisingly, they clung to a three-point lead. But the Broncos still had one roll of the dice remaining. The Broncos' Jim Turner, however, could not roll a three. Thus did the young and coming Lions add another chapter to their Turkey Day anthology. Granted, this win will not be confused with Detroit's legendary Thanksgiving triumphs, but it just may signal the beginning of a new period in Lion football. Monty Clark's patient rebuilding program is turning things around in the Motor City, and the star of the show is only a rookie. In Buffalo, Joe Pisarczyk and the New York Giants were all business as they set out to atone for their last second embarrassment against the Eagles. Jersey Joe and the Giants mustered enough offense to make it close, but each time New York appeared to have the Bills in check, Buffalo found a way out of trouble. Here, number 25, Roland Hooks lobbied long and hard for a touchdown call. But the zebra on the scene ruled that Hooks had traveled only 66 of the necessary 67 yards. No matter, though, for he scored on the next play. But Hooks' 100-yard day was rather ordinary compared to the virtuoso performance of rookie Terry Miller, number 40. Miller rushed for 208 yards and two touchdowns as Buffalo blew out the New Yorkers 41-17. A blowout. Now that's what most folks were expecting in Oakland, where Jim Zorn and the Seahawks were trying to make it two in a row against the Raiders. But as always, the Seahawks were not intimidated. Seattle's pass protection held up, and Zorn's accuracy once again was razor sharp. Zorn went to reserve wide receiver Steve Rabel for Seattle's first score. Then in period four, trailing by a field goal, the left-hander rolled right, and his premier pass catcher had the Raiders' secondary beat. Number 80 is Steve Largent. Three years ago, he and Zorn played their first game in Seattle. This year, they'll both probably play in the Pro Bowl. But lest we forget, there was another left-handed quarterback on the floor of the Oakland Coliseum, and Ken Stabler takes a back seat to nobody. Unfortunately for the Raiders, the point after was missed and Oakland could not run out the clock. Thus, with just seconds remaining, the Seahawks set up for a potential game-winning field goal. Kicker Efren Herrera must be accustomed to big moments such as this one. 
but Jim Zorn still overflows with youthful enthusiasm. Herrera's 46-yarder gave Seattle their second win of the season over the Raiders, the first time since 1965 that Oakland has dropped both ends of a home and away series. No expansion team can do that.